Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Amateur Radio General Class, session number 10. During our previous class, we had a question pool review. We looked at what oscillators were. We looked at the LC oscillator. We dealt with the various classes of amplifiers. We also looked at radio frequency amplifier, if, uh, amplifier efficiency. We looked at self-oscillation. Also, the low-pass filter cutoff frequency. We dealt with filter input and output impedances. We also looked at the bandpass filter passband, as well as filters, the properties called ultimate rejection and insertion loss. Also, we looked at filters, the usage in transmitters. We also discussed what the super heterodyne receiver was, also an FM receiver. And then we went on to the concept of di direct digital synthesizer or DDS. And we ended with SDR or software defined radio. In terms of our curriculum, we are progressing quite nicely. We are onto the topic now, signals and emissions. So we have still quite a ways to go yet, but we're making good progress. Again, encouragement to consider taking practice exams. These are the links. We had no questions from the last class, so we press on. And we will now go to the questions in the question pool for that matches the theory that we did last class. Okay, so again, we would have dealt with all of the theory in respect of these questions. So we'll go through the questions pretty quickly. So let's start. Just a reminder, the number or the characters in brackets right after the question is the question pool number. And you can search in the question pool that we had circulated to everyone for this number to see the actual question in the question pool that includes the distractors or the incorrect answers in case you want to have a look at that on your own time. So let's get straight into the questions. Which of the following are basic components of a sine wave oscillator? So what they're asking us here, the components, the basic components of what? A sine wave oscillator. So we dealt with this the last time and we said there is a filter as well as an amplifier in a feedback loop, right? So remember the output of the amplifier fed back into the input of the amplifier, but through a filter circuit. So that's the basic components of a sine wave oscillator. Next question. What determines the frequency of an LC oscillator? So if you remember, L and C, that will be inductor and capacitor. So that gives a clue to the answer and we're dealing with an oscillator circuit. So what determines the frequency? Well, it's the inductance and capacitance in the tank circuit because that circuit is called a tank circuit. Next question. Which of the following describes a linear amplifier? And as we learned in the last class, it is an amplifier in which the output preserves the input waveform. In other words, there's no distortion. So that's what a linear amplifier is. The output preserves the input. It is very similar to the input except amplified or larger. Next question in question pool. Which of the classes of amplifiers has the highest efficiency? Last class, we dealt with the various classes of amplifiers, E, B, A, B, C, D, and so on. So they're asking us which one has the highest efficiency. And as we learned the last class, we spent a little time on talking about it. It was the class C amplifier that had the highest efficiency. Next question. For which of the following modes is a class C power stage appropriate for amplifying a modulated signal? 
So they're asking us which mode. So is it AM, is it CW, is it FM, and so on and so on. All right, so which mode? Class C. All right, so if you could recall the last class, we said that the type of amplifier we need for FM would be class C, so therefore the answer would be FM. Next question. How is the efficiency of an RF power amplifier determined? What are they asking us? They're asking us how to calculate efficiency of an RF power amp. How do we calculate that? We learned the last class, we had the formula. We take the RF output power and divide it by the DC input power. So that's the answer. Next question in the question pool. What is the reason for neutralizing the final amplifier stage of a transmitter? So let's, let's just dissect this question. They're asking us for a reason. So in other words, why? What's, what's the reason? But for what? For neutralizing the final amplifier stage of a transmitter. And if you remember from the theory, we talked about the amplifier having stray capacitance that could affect the performance of the amplifier. And the way we, do, we deal with that is that we uh, neutralize it using something like a capacitor as well in the circuit. And the reason for that is to avoid or eliminate self-oscillation. That's what that stray capacitance or parasitic capacitance or extra capacitance or unwanted capacitance does. There's self-oscillation, which is undesirable for our circuit. So that's why we neutralize to eliminate self-oscillations. Next question in the question pool. What is the frequency above which a low-pass filter's output power is less than half the input power? So let's dissect this question. So they're asking us, what is the frequency? So it's something frequency. Above which a low-pass filter. So if you recall last class, we had the graph of the low-pass low filter, where the output power is less than half the input power. So remember, we consider the filter to be effective when it reduces the power level by a half. So that point is called the cutoff frequency. So again, if you need a review of this, just look at the slides from the last class or the recording. Moving right along. What should be the impedance of a low-pass filter as compared to the impedance of the transmission line into which it is inserted? So let's dissect this question. So they're asking us about impedance. But of what? A low-pass filter. Compared to what? The impedance of the transmission line into which it's inserted. So that's, if you recall the diagram, we showed how we insert a low-pass filter in the transmission line. So they're asking us about uh, the comparison of the impedance of the low-pass filter to that of the transmission line. And remember the little mantra that we've been using for a while, that hams are matchmakers? Well, we try to make a good match, so therefore the answer is the impedances should be about the same. Okay, moving right along. Next question in the question pool. The bandwidth of a bandpass filter is measured between what two frequencies? Let's dissect. So, we are talking here about a bandpass filter, right? Not a low-pass filter, a bandpass filter, okay? So, what they're asking us is the bandwidth measured between what two frequencies? And if you remember the diagram for the bandpass filter, we measure the frequencies at which point is 3 dB or minus 3 dB, which is halfway point. So those two halfway points are considered the upper and the lower half power points. So that's the answer. The upper and lower half power points or frequencies. Next question in the question pool. What term specifies a filter's maximum ability to reject signals outside its pass band? We learned that term as the ultimate rejection. That's the ability to um, maximum reject the signal outside of the passband. Ultimate rejection is the term. Next question. What term specifies a filter's attenuation inside of its passband? 
So remember, we said that a filter isn't perfect. When we put it into the circuit, there is some loss, even in the area that it passes the frequency. Outside of the passband, of course, it rejects the frequency and attenuates it. We know that. But even in the area that we want the filter to pass the frequencies, there is still some loss, and that loss is called insertion loss. Moving right along. Which circuit is used to combine signals from the carrier oscillator and speech amplifier, then send the result to the filter in some SSB or single sideband phone transmitters? So let's dissect this question. So they're asking us, which circuit? So is it a mixer circuit? Is it a filter circuit? Is it a balance modulator circuit? Is it a product detector circuit? Is it an oscillator circuit? What circuit? is used to combine the signal from the carrier oscillator and the speech amplifier. So we just need to look back at our uh, theory where we showed the block diagrams of the various stages and we just need to see what circuit is combining the oscillator to the speech amplifier. And the next stage it goes on to will be the filter in the case of an SSB transmitter. So that circuit was called the balanced modulator. Moving right along. Which of the following is used to process signals from the balanced modulator, then send them to the mixer in some single sideband or SSB phone transmitters? So let's dissect this question. So remember, anytime we talk phone, we mean voice as opposed to data or a computer using uh, transmitting or con uh, connecting to the com uh, computer to the radio. When we say phone, it's voice, you are speaking into the radio, not using a computer. So phone is essentially voice. Think about it, you pick up your phone and talk to someone. So anytime in amateur radio we talk about phone, we are talking about voice. So which of the following circuit or stages is used to process signals from the balance modulator? So in other words, it's stage right after the balance modulator. If we were to look at our trusty diagram, we will see that the stage that is right after the balance modulator uh, that goes into the SSB mixer is called the filter stage. All right, so any doubts about that? Just have a look at the slides and the slide deck or the recordings and you will see the block diagrams that shows you diagrammatically which comes first, the chicken or the egg. All right. So, moving right along. Which circuit is used to process signals from the RF amplifier and the local oscillator, then send the result to the IF or intermediate frequency filter in a super heterodyne receiver. So we need to look at the block diagram for super heterodyne receiver, and we will see that the circuit that is, that is used to process the signal from the RF amplifier and the local oscillator, remember where we saw we had a local oscillator feeding into a circuit and then the other side fed into the circuit was the RF, well, that was called the mixer, right? So let's just move along again. What circuit is used to combine signals from the IF amplifier and BFO and send the result to the AF amplifier in some single sideband receiver? So let's dissect this question a little bit. So they're giving us all of the abbreviations. So IF is intermediate frequency, BFO, beat frequency oscillator, and AF audio frequency. All right, so they're asking us what circuit is combining the stage, the IF amplifier stage with the BFO. So there's a block diagram that shows that that circuit is called the product detector. And from the product detector, it goes into the audio amplifier stage that goes out to the speaker. So all we need to do is look at that block diagram and we will see that that uh, circuit that combines the two, the IF amplifier stage and the BFO is called the product detector. Well, one of the names is the product detector. Next question in the question pool. What is the simplest combination of stages that implement a super heterodyne receiver? So we did have a slide that shows the minimum components of a super het receiver. And those are the HF oscillator, the mixer and the detector. Moving right along. What circuit is used in analog FM receivers to convert IF output signals to audio? So let's dissect this question a little bit. So they're asking us for what circuit 
So is it a product detector circuit? Is it a filter circuit? Is it a mixer circuit? Is it a discriminator circuit? And so on. But notice they're asking us about an FM receiver, analog FM. So we may remember when we did the block diagram on the FM receiver that that detector was called a discriminator. And that's actually the answer, right? So what circuit is used in the FM receivers to convert the intermediate frequency output to the audio? That is the detectors called the discriminator. Okay. Next question in the question pool. Which of the following is a typical application for a DDS, direct digital synthesizer? So if we may recall, the DDS is where we have a crystal that's oscillating and it's very uh, stable uh, because it uses the crystal and so on. Well, the answer to that is a high stability variable frequency oscillator in a transceiver. So that's the typical application for a DDS in your transceiver, but note that it is high stability for variable frequency. Next question in the question pool. Similar question, which of the following is an advantage of a direct digital synthesizer? So the advantage really is that we can change the frequency. So we have a variable frequency, but we have the stability of a crystal oscillator. We did have a student, I think it was Ramzan, who was pointing out that uh, apart from the LC type oscillators, they are also crystal oscillators. He was quite correct. And that is used in the DDS. That's the term that we use to describe when we have a crystal oscillator. So that's the advantage. We have variable frequency, but with the stability of a crystal oscillator. So very stable circuit. That's the advantage. Okay, next question in the question pool. What is meant by the term software defined radio or SDR? Remember we said that's the in thing, latest, hottest technology in amateur radio. What is meant by SDR? Well, it's a radio in which most signal processing functions are performed by software. That's the beauty about software-defined radio. Instead of having just hardware components alone that's uh, doing very specific things, you have generic circuitry that can use software to process the signals in various forms and fashions. So that's the term SDR. Moving right along. Speaking of SDR, what is the phase difference between the I and Q signals that software-defined radio or SDR equipment uses for modulation and demodulation. So they're asking us what is the phase difference between the I and Q signals, right? The I and the quadrature signals, what the phase difference is? We learned that it was 90 degrees, 9-0. And then they ask us now, last question before we go into some theory. What is an advantage of using I and Q signals in software-defined radios or SDR? What is an advantage? Well, these, the answer is all types or any type of modulation can be created with appropriate processing in software. So that's where the I and Q signals come in. We can process them in software without having to change the hardware. Okay. So let's go back into our slides, our slide deck, and do some theory. So we start off today's theory with modulation, but this should not be a stranger to us in that we dealt with modulation during the technician class and some of what we are doing here really is a rehash of that, but with a little more detail. So what is modulation? Well, it's defined as the process by which we convey information over a radio link. In other words, we're using radio. That's why we are studying amateur radio. So we're using radios. But we can't just use the radio. We have to do something to get the information on. So that information sometimes is voice or speech or sometimes it's a computer that's generating some sort of information. And when we put that information from the speech or from the computer onto the radio so that the radio wave will carry all of that information, that signal will contain the information that is called modulation or modulating the carrier wave. So that's what we're seeing here. We have 
uh, some examples. We dealt with these before. AM, amplitude modulation, FM, frequency modulation, and there's also phase modulation, sometimes called PM. And we have diagrams here, which will be reproduced in some future slides uh, in our slide deck. But just to give an example or sample of what they look like. This is AM. Notice how the amplitude varies up and down. Right? It's the amplitude of the signal that we are varying. We have our carrier, which is steady, and then we have our modulating signal. That could be our data, uh, or that could be our voice. That's the modulating signal, and then we end up with the modulated signals. And notice how this carrier that started off nice and steady like this is now varying up and down because we have added the modulating signal or voice. And then we have frequency modulation now. Notice, we start off with the carrier, we apply the same modulating signal, but notice the modulated signal doesn't vary in amplitude, it varies in frequency. Notice it's closer space here, it's further space here, it's closer space here, further space. So the frequency is actually what is changing, not the amplitude. The amplitude or the height of it is staying the same. Notice in amplitude modulating, modulation, it's the amplitude that is going up and down or shifting. But with frequency modulation, it stays the same amplitude, but we change the frequency as the signal is applied. And then we have phase modulation, which is a little quirky one to understand, but look at it here. Notice the wave here. We have the same carrier, and then we have the same voice or modulating signal that we apply. And notice that it's phase modulated. So here's a frequency, then it reverses the phase, and then the phase is reversed again, and so on. So that's what we mean by phase modulation. It's all three of them for you to see the difference what the diagram looks like between amplitude modulation, frequency modulation, and phase modulation. So let's go into a little more detail on amplitude modulation. So amplitude modulation, or AM, and you may already be familiar with AM. Back in the day, you know, we had AM radio stations in Trinidad and Tobago, were very popular, those who would remember it, Radio 610 and Radio 730 um, on the AM band. Yes, 730 kilohertz, 610 kilohertz. So that's AM, amplitude modulation. You remember how that used to sound, right? Uh, very bassy and scratchy and so on, compared to FM. But we're dealing with amplitude modulation, and it's a very basic type of modulation. The amplitude or the vertical height, as well as the instantaneous power level of the radio frequency carrier is what is varied. And it's varied in proportion to the amplitude of the audio signal, or I would say the loudness. So notice here, just like before, we have the same diagram here for AM on the bottom right hand corner. All right, so it's the same AM signal that we're looking at here, but we're breaking it out here. We have the audio or the voice signal or the message signal, and then we are applying it to the carrier signal. And when we do the modulation, we end up with the modulated signal. So this is our output. So notice that the amplitude is what is varying. The height of the signal is what is varying in accordance with your voice as you speak the signal shifts according to your voice. So that is amplitude modulation. And notice that the power level, of course, increases and decreases or varies according to the audio signal. Again, this is an exam question in the question pool. Next week when we come to it, you'll see how the question applies. So you need to learn this about amplitude modulation or AM. So we need to now talk about the concept of modulation envelope. So we're still under AM. So on the right hand side here, we have the same message signal and then we have the carrier signal. And when we apply the message signal onto the carrier signal, we have the modulated wave or the AM signal. But there's the concept of a modulation envelope and it is defined as the smooth curve that connects the peaks of the modulated signal and it gives the, that gives the overall waveform. So notice before we have the modulated signal here, but if we were to join all of the peaks together, notice this line here. We're joining all of the peaks of the modulated signal. That is called the modulation envelope. And we need to know that for our exam. Okay, and note that when we demodulate an AM signal, what we get is the waveform that looks just like the modulation envelope. Right? So that's when we transmit our AM signal and someone else receives it. When they decode it and they demodulate it, the signal becomes becomes the voice signal, the audio signal, is very similar. It looks just like the modulation envelope. So now we come to signal sideband, or SSB. We dealt with SSB before in the technician class, so we'll expound on it a little bit. SSB, single sideband, is just a type of amplitude modulation. 
because it starts off with amplitude modulation and we subtract stuff. So an AM signal has three components. There's the carrier. So on our diagram here, this is the carrier frequency. But we also have the lower sideband, which is the lower frequencies as we modulate and so on and demodulate. Uh, as we modulate the signals, we have lower side and upper side. The frequencies just below the carrier and frequencies just above. So that's how we say, you know, we occupy a bandwidth. When we transmit a signal, it doesn't just occupy a spot on the spectrum. It actually occupies a range of frequencies. And they have the carrier, which is the center frequency. And then below the carrier frequency, we consider that the lower sideband. And above the carrier frequency, we call that the upper sideband. So those are the three components about an AM signal. Lower sideband part, upper sideband part, and the carrier frequency. But it's interesting to note that the carrier frequency carries no information at all. And that the both sidebands, if you look at the sidebands, you kind of notice they mirror each other. So we say that the both sidebands, the lower sideband and the upper sideband actually carry the same exact information. So think about it. The carrier frequency carries no information at all. The lower sideband carries the same exact information as upper sideband. So long time ago, people figured out, but wait a minute. If I eliminate the carrier and one of the sidebands, I could carry the same information by just using one of the sidebands, and that is exactly what single sideband is. The circuitry takes out the carrier frequency and it takes out one of the sidebands. So if you take out the lower sideband, you end up with an upper sideband signal. If you take out the upper sideband, you end up with a lower sideband signal. And you have all the information there. And look at the bottom diagram here. We have taken out the lower sideband, we have taken out the carrier. Frequency, but guess what? The upper sideband carries all of the same information just as well. So there you go. So we say that the carrier signal carries no information. Both sidebands, upper and lower, carry the same information. And if you eliminate the carrier and one of the sidebands, you can still transfer the same amount of information. And that's the beauty of single sideband. So a little more information on single sideband. One of the advantages of single sideband is that it has a narrower bandwidth than AM, FM, or PM, or phase, phase modulation. And that is actually an exam question. And this diagram on the right-hand side should look very familiar to us who have uh, looked uh, taking the technician class uh, classes. It's the same diagram that we showed the comparison between the various. We have CW inside of there as well. It shows you how much bandwidth the different types of modes occupied, okay? And we also say that a single sideband signal takes up only three kilohertz. And you can see that here, this is the amount of bandwidth it's taking, three kilohertz or 3,000 hertz. And it's the narrowest bandwidth of the phone or voice modes. So that is an exam question. You know, which phone mode uses the lowest amount of bandwidth? It is SSB, single sideband. And we have a comparison here. It shows an EM signal requires a bandwidth of six kilohertz or more. And an FM signal can require up to 15 kilohertz or 15,000 hertz. So this is a comparison just to prove to you, uh, the, for, in terms of voice or phone modes, SSB occupies the lowest amount of bandwidth. So it's very efficient. Remember, as hams, we try to be as efficient as possible. So let us take a break, take a stretch, have a bathroom break, and maybe drink a little bit of water, and we'll come back in two minutes' time.
Okay, welcome back everyone. And to answer the question, um, well, I know because of how we are doing the presentations, it may look as though it's only you in the class. Um, unfortunately, um, uh, because of how we're doing it, we don't uh, show all of the persons online. So we have over 200 persons in the class. And um, uh, the, yes, so just to confirm, it's not only you there, Adish. Um, you're just that you're, you're not able to see all of the participants, and we do apologize for that. All right, cool. <laughs> okay, nice. So let's continue uh, right along. All right. So, so of course, you know, in life, sometimes too much of a good thing is good for nothing. At least that's what some, uh, you know, to say. So we come now to the concept of overmodulation. So we dealt with modulation. So we want to modulate our signal. We want to put our voice. We want to be loud. We want to be heard. We don't want to whisper like that and no one is hearing us. So we can be too loud. And that is what overmodulation is, right? We too, you know, we uh, apply too much of a high level of speech. And when that happens, you know, you will sound terrible to the person on the other side. So imagine I'm in Trinidad and Tobago and I am speaking too loudly into my microphone. And let's say we have friends there in St. Lucia and he's listening to me and he's saying, but wait a minute, Robbie's sounding so terrible because he's overmodulating, he's driving his voice too hard and the circuitry is not compensating for it. So you might have to repeat yourself and you might also cause interference because when you overmodulate, you might use a spectrum that uh, other persons are using and therefore you're causing interference. So overmodulation is not a good thing. And as a ham, as an amateur radio operator, we need to know about these things so we can optimize and make sure that we are heard loud and clear. Our signals are received uh, without any interference and without any distortion. And you may have experienced distortion. Sometimes a TV ra radio station, you may hear someone sounding super loud and you're like, what's going on there? Well, they are over modulating. The same thing that happened to us in amateur radio when we're using our equipment. So we say that an amateur has to be very careful when setting the audio level used to modulate an AM or SSB signal. And we have some diagrams on the right hand side here. Uh, so the the first one, we see a signal that is not modulated at all, zero modulation. Then we have a signal that is 50% modulated, right, with AM or SSB. So notice how the signal varies. And then we have 100% modulation, which is the maximum we should go. But anything beyond that, we have more than 100% modulation, and that is where the distortion, the distortion or the overmodulation. Uh, comes in, we cause interference, and we have something called flat topping. So if this is your signal here, uh, properly adjusted, when you overmodulate, you get distortion, and you have clipping and flat topping. Part of your signal is lost, and you know, no one wants to drive their audio too heavy. So it says if the level is driven too high, the signal will be overmodulated, and, and this can cause the signal to be distorted to, due to flat topping. So it's the same way, you don't want to be too soft, but you certainly do not want to be too hard as well. One effect of overmodulation is that the signal can also take up excessive bandwidth beyond what is permitted. So you need to know that for your exam. Uh, if you drive your audio too, have, too hard, you will use frequencies a little more than you should and therefore you may interfere with another person's signal. So excessive bandwidth could be consumed if you overmodulate. So we dealt with AM, amplitude modulation. We are now coming to frequency modulation and then we will talk about phase modulation shortly afterwards. So frequency modulation is very popular in amateur radio. It is used regularly, especially with VHF and UHF uh, simplex and repeater modes. So FM is very popular even with today's digital modes, FM is used and very popular. So with an FM signal, the carrier's instantaneous frequency changes proportionally to the instantaneous amplitude of the modulating signal. So what do we mean by that? So as we speak, as we apply our voice or whatever signal into the radio and it generates a carrier frequency, the frequency changes as we speak. So that's what this diagram below here is going to show us in a moment. But on the right hand side here, we have the same diagram, the same one of the three diagrams that we showed at the start. You have the carrier 
and then we have our modulating signal such as our voice and then we end up now with a modulated signal notice the amplitude is the same but the frequency is changing so notice the waves here are closer they are further apart here they are closer so that's a change in frequency the frequency is changing that's why it's frequency modulation so we have a radio wave that is unmodulated and then we have a voice signal for example or some sort of audio signal and it goes and of course it's applied to the carrier wave and then we end up with the output of the radio looking like this this is frequency modulated notice the amplitude is steady but the frequency the spacing between the wave is what is changing that's how you know the frequency is changing the amplitude is remaining the same remember under amplitude modulation the amplitude was going up and down but notice how it's steady as she goes here but it's the frequency that is changing closer frequency wider frequency closer wider and so on or higher frequency lower frequency higher frequency lower frequency higher frequency lower frequency that is frequency modulation and for the exam you need to know that the amplitude changes according to the signal that's modulating it the frequency changes proportionally to that audio signal so we now come to phase modulation Phase modulation is another way to produce a frequency modulated signal. But look at it on the right hand side here. We have the same carrier wave unmodulated. Then we have our audio, our speech, our voice, for example, or computer generated signal that we apply to the carrier and then we end up with the modulated signal. But notice amplitude is remaining the same. But what is changing here is our phase. Notice how it switches as it's supposed to go up. It's supposed to continue all the way, but it changes the phase. That's what we mean by phase modulation. It goes here and then the phase changes. And then the phase changes and the phase changes. So this is phase modulation. Now to produce a phase modulated signal, the modulator changes the phase angle of the signal. So that is what is changed, the phase angle. The modulator that is used to produce a phase modulated signal is called a reactance modulator. And changes in reactance causes a phase shift in the output signal. So this is really just saying the same thing as the previous point. So phase modulation, it's the phase that is changed or we change the phase angle of the signal along the way to produce that type of modulation known as PM or phase modulation. So we now come to another type of uh, mode that's called uh, frequency shift keying. So this should be PS, uh, FS key, not PS key, all right? So a little typo on this um, slide here. So FS key. So some modes, such as RITI, and we dealt with RITI during our technician class, uses a modulation method called frequency shift keying, or FS key. And we know that RITI is a digital signal mode, and it consists of two signal levels, a mark or a space. And a mark is sent at one frequency, and a, sp a space is sent at another frequency. So the RITI signal, therefore, alternates between one and the other. It alternates between a mark and a space. That's RTTY, or RITI. As we learned in the technician class, it's radio teletype. And FSK signal is generated by changing an oscillator's frequency directly with a digital control signal. So you need to know this for your exam. How it's generated, you have the oscillator's frequency that is changing, but via a digital control signal. So let's look at it diagrammatically here. So this is frequency shift keying or FSK. So we have our carrier wave here as before, but notice our modulated signal is that one and zero or the mark and the space, mark and the space. And that is applied to the carrier. And notice here how the frequency, the amplitude is the same, but notice that the frequency, we have a lower frequency, we have a higher frequency here. Lower frequency, higher frequency, lower frequency, higher frequency. And it is in step with the digital modulating signal. So that is the what we refer to as the digital control signal here. And it is causing the modulated signal to end up as a frequency shift keyed signal. So it's generated by having an oscillator frequency, so consider this carrier frequency as the oscillator frequency, uh, di uh, very directly with a digital control signal, consider this modulated signal as the uh, digital control signal. When you add this to this, you end up with a modulated signal where the frequency changes in step with the modulated signal. So that is how 
uh, Ritty is done using FSK frequency shift keying. And we now come to PSK, which is phase shift keying. Now you're probably starting to see a pattern in all of these things, and you could probably very well guess what phase shift keying. If we just describe what um, frequency shift keying or FSK is, you probably can guess what PSK or phase shift keying is. So let's go. Phase shift keying, PSK, is another way to send digital signals whereby the phase of the modulation is changed, not the frequency, as in FSK. You need to learn about BPSK, which is binary phase shift keying, that shifts the phase 180 degrees to send one bit at a time. Okay, so BPSK sends one bit at a time. Then there's another type of PSK, so we were dealing with BPSK, binary phase shift keying. There's another type of PSK called QPSK, which is quadrature phase shift keying, which allows more phase shift options, so you can send two bits at a time. So if we were to compare, we have BPSK, binary shift, phase shift keying, which can send one bit at a time. And then quadrature phase shift keying, or QPSK, that allows us to send two bits at a time. On the bottom right-hand corner here, we have a diagram showing that, that BPSK, you're extending one bit at a time, 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 one bit at a time. But with QPSK, we are sending two bits at a time, 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 two bits at a time. And notice that they use both BPSK and QPSK uh, about the same amount of bandwidth. It's slightly higher for the QPSK, but it's approximately the same. Eh? It's not very far different. So in a way, you could say QPSK is more efficient or effective in that way because it's using the same approximate amount of bandwidth, but you're getting more information being sent with QPSK compared to BPSK because BPSK, we are sending one a uh, bit at a time or one bit per symbol, one bit alone, one bit alone, one bit alone. But when we do QPSK, we're sending two bits, a one and a zero, a one and a one, or a zero and a one, or a zero and a zero. And so it's two bits for the same amount of effort, really, in terms of the bandwidth. So that's why we say that while a BPSK shifts either plus or minus 180 degrees, a QPSK can shift 45, 185, 225, or 315 degrees which allows us to send the data faster and it uses a slightly higher bandwidth. So we'll compare and contrast that to the next slide. So even though we are saying slightly higher bandwidth, it really is slightly higher. As a matter of fact, we could approximately, we could approximate that and say about the same bandwidth, which we will do in the next slide. But just note, it's slightly higher bandwidth for your information. You know, nothing is free. So you give up a little bit, but it's not a whole lot that you have to give up to get that extra in. And we'll come to the next slide that talks about it being approximately the same. So don't get tied up when we say here it's slightly higher. And then on the next slide, we're talking about approximately the same. It's just slightly higher. If you want to use, you could say negligibly higher. So if it's negligible, it's about the same. Yeah. So QPSK31 is a mode that we need to know. Again, we did BPSKs, we did QPSKs, right? And we said BPSK was one bit at a time, QPSK, two bits at a time. But we're coming to now a QPSK, but QPSK 31, or 31 board. That is really what the 31 there means. And we need to learn this about QPSK 31 for exams. We need to know that it is sideband sensitive. We need to know that there's error correction in the signal and also that the bandwidth is approximately the same as BPSK31. So remember, we are comparing BPSK with QPSK. Again, this diagram below here shows BPSK signal versus a QPSK signal, and we're saying it takes about the same amount of bandwidth, but we can double the amount of information that is transmitted at one time. So just like you have a BPSK and QPSK gener generic, there is QPSK31 and there's also BPSK31. And we just need to know for the exam that both of them, BPSK31 and QPSK31, utilizes approximately the same amount of bandwidth. So this is just something we did learn for the exam when it comes to this question. All right. So now we come to a very contemporary mode. 
FT8. So again, in the technician class, we did mention FT8 a little bit, but we delve a little bit more in detail about FT8. FT8 is a mode. It's very popular, very much in use. It's actually uh, very big right now in amateur radio. It has been for a couple of years because of the low sunspot cycle where propagation of radio signals through the ionosphere uh, being refracted was not so good for a number of years because we were in the low portion of that 11-year sunspot cycle. Now the cycle has taken off a little bit and it's on the upward trend. But in those days of weak propagation, uh, we had modes such as FT8 and some other modes that came just before it. So for our exam, we need to know that FT8 is a popular new mode, a relatively new mode, and it's narrow, it uses very narrow amount of spectrum, and it's a digital mode. The software that we use, and remember from the technician class, we said digital modes, we tend to use a computer connected to a transceiver or radio to do digital modes. Some radios do have a built-in computer that you could do it by itself, but typically you have a laptop or a computer or some computing device connected to your radio to produce digital modes. So instead of speaking into the radio and getting your message across the airwaves to the other radio operator, you have a computer that's connected that is generating those signals or those tones for you, and those are digital modes. The software that is very popular now is called WSJTX. There are many, many other pieces of software as well, as well as even variants of WSJTX. But WSJTX is a very popular software application that is used to generate and receive FT8 signals. And inside of that software, there are some very sophisticated digital signal processing techniques. And it allows you to receive those very weak signals and signals with low signal-to-noise ratios. So, uh, the other screen, I'll show you what the, F the WSGTX software looks like, just for your information. Uh, we have a screen grab and a screenshot of it coming up. And we need to know for the exam that the modulation used by the FT8 signal is an eight-tone frequency shift keying, or FSK. So, not too difficult to remember, FT8, that 8 there means 8 tones. So FT8, it's an 8 tone, but it's an 8 tone FSK, frequency shift keying signal. Just like what we were looking at here, frequency shift keying, that's what the signal is going to be, an FSK. And this, you don't have to learn this, this is just something extra for persons who like to see, well, you know, they will say, well, um, could you show me what the frame looks like for an FSK signal? This is exactly what it looks like here. Don't need to learn this for the exam or anything, but just in case you're interested, what an FSK frame looks like, this is what it looks like here. But for the exam, we need to know that an FT8 signal is an eight-tone FSK signal. So I did promise you a screenshot of what the WSGTX software looks like, and this is just to show you, make it real. Don't need to know this for the exam, you need to know what it looks like. But on the left-hand side here is what the WSJTX software looks like. You will see here um, information, these are transmissions that are being received by the computer through the radio, and these are stations that are calling each other, uh, and so on. And on the right-hand side here, you have transmissions that are going and coming in. So. Uh, this is the interface or the software that is used to produce FT8 signals. So no one is speaking. We are using an amateur radio device, yes, but we have a computer connected to the transceiver or the radio. And we are typing this information here and say transmit, and it will transmit this information. Uh, the computer will generate the tones. The tones will be sent across to the radio or your transceiver via an interface and that radio will transmit the signals over the airwaves, uh, hits the ionosphere, for example, or goes a ground wave, and goes to a far distant uh, amateur radio operator who will receive your signal, and they will also use software just like this, WSGTX software, and they will demodulate or decode your transmission, and the information will dis be displayed on their computer screen just like you are seeing as well. And they'll say, hey, uh, this person is calling me, and they will respond one of these sequences here, automating the sequence. And it will then 
uh, display on their screen, it will display on your screen their transmissions and you make that contact. That is how the amateur radio operators will use WSGTX software to communicate with each other. And on the right hand side here, this is a screen grab for some recent work that I would have done using FT8 modes. So you can see this is a map and what you're seeing here, all of these lines show contact. So in the center here, I know you can't see clearly it's Trinidad and Tobago or the Caribbean. And my station would have made contacts or the transmissions would have been heard by stations around the world using this FT8 mode, using the HF spectrum on what we call the 17 meter band. And that's why it's yellow in color, 17 meter band. So you see all of the stations would have received the transmission and some of whom I would have had a communication or what we call a QSO, <laughs> a virtual uh, conversation with. Uh, across the world. So this is making it real. We have a computer with WSJTX software. We have an HF radio with an antenna and we transmit radio signals across the world and people around the world transmit back to us and we communicate using these or this digital mode known as FT8 and the software called WSJTX. So that's it for our theory today. We might be finishing up just a couple of minutes early, uh, just as well. Um, curfew started at 7 o'clock, and we know everyone might be anxious and eager to get some stuff done. So just a reminder, everyone is invited to participate in Zello. So you have that screen there in case you need the links to uh, get onto the React Numbers channel. If you're interested in participating, we welcome you. And we're asking persons who would have just joined the class. We still have persons joining the class. And we're asking everyone to brush up and check up on the playlist from the technician level of the course. We are currently doing the general class level, but we have a previous level called the technician class. And all 16 sessions in the technician class are recorded at this link, including you can get uh, the link to all of the handouts as well. So again, we continue to communicate at least once per week to all of the recipients. Uh, via email, we're still sending out SMS text messages. Uh, if you don't get let me know so we can know things are not working as far as the communication goes. Uh, also, if you have any questions, please send via email or via WhatsApp. Uh, we still remind persons we are under uh, good restrictions in Trinidad and Tobago for COVID-19. We have an SOE. Some good news um, really in that you know the cases are still high but seems to be reducing. Uh, we are, are praying everyone to you know be safe out there. We're still in the hurricane season, just started. Uh, we're seeing some tropical waves coming across already. Of course, it's a concern for everyone or, or up the Caribbean and persons in the United States as well have to be on the lookout. Uh, just to let everyone know, we do have the uh, session that is coming up. It'll be optional for participants in this class. Uh, we're doing it for React. It's called Radio Operation Tips and Techniques coming up. So we will be inviting everyone uh, to either be on the live stream or we'll have it hopefully recorded. Uh, because we've been deal doing a lot of theory and operating practices and so on in the amateur class, but we want to get into some things that are not necessarily discussed uh, or part of our exams in terms of how do we operate a radio? What are the best practices, especially for emergency communications? So we will keep you posted on when that is coming up. It will be a similar webinar to these. Our next session, well, of course, it's not going to be Friday the 11th, I didn't update that. So our next class is expected to be Friday the 18th of June. So next week, Friday, God's willing at 8.30 p.m. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for staying the course. Really impressed with everyone who has been able to uh, attend. And if you don't attend, look at the recording. And we really appreciate you being in these classes and hopefully uh, gaining the knowledge and information and also to be able to take the exams when that time comes. So everyone, do have a good night. Be safe, take good care, and all the best. Okay, Bob, good night to you as well. Larry, good night. Okay, John, great to have you in the class. Nice, nice to see you there, man. Erskine, good night. Ramzan, good night as well. Jessica, good night. Adish, all the best to you, man. Wesley, good night as well. Natasha, good night. Okay, Roger, good night to you as well. All right. Okay, Adish, take care. All right. Okay, uh, I'll communicate with you, Larry, in respect of the books. Okay, Adish, sure. 
Okay, Ramza, not a problem. You're welcome. Adrian, Sidley, you're welcome. And do have a good night also. Adesh, yeah, God bless. You be safe too. Jessica, you're welcome. All the best. Yes, George, thanks a lot, man. You have a good night and you be safe too. Yes, get a good rest. Sylvester, have a good night. You be safe too. Okay, Mac, you're welcome. Definitely. And have a good night also. Okay, Gary, have a good night. Yes, you too. Be good. Thanks. Okay, Jermaine, all the best. Have a good night. Take good care. All right, Larry, all the best. Wesley, good night again. Charlene, also you too. Not a problem. The recording will be available as soon as, and we'll send it to you so you'll catch up on whatever the little bit that you would have missed. You continue to be safe. All right, Desi. Okay, you didn't get the SMS, so I'll check that out. All right, have a good night too. Okay, Iskin. Not a problem at all. We know work priorities, but you have the recordings all available to you, so you can check them out at your leisure. Okay, Eustace, you have a great weekend too. Take good care. Not a problem, Larry. Okay, Marissa, you too. Have a good night. Be safe. Okay, Iskin, take care. Kevin, good night. All the best. Thanks for the kind comments. Really appreciate it. All right, Larry. Roger, have a good night, man. You too. Take good care. Anthony, as well. Have a good night. Not a problem. Oh, okay, so that's who Abba was. Uh, gotcha. Right. Lovely. You're certainly welcome, Marissa. Take good care. Have a good night.